everyone to worship uh, this Sunday morning. It's uh, wonderful to have you with us as St. Mark gathers uh, to worship online. We're delighted that you're part of our community and we hope that this hour is one of great blessing for you. So I invite us all to prepare our hearts and minds for the highest and best of human endeavors, that is the worship of God. Let us begin with prayer. Oh God, we gather to worship you with heart and mind and voice. Awaken us to your ever-present love, store in us new winds of your Holy Spirit, free us from habits of hesitation to trust, so that we might become more wholly yours. And you, O oh God, rest the unwritten stories of our lives, the fulfillment of dreams we hardly dare to dream, the revelation of the people we can become. It is in Christ that we are made one with you. It is in Christ that your purposes for us are fulfilled. And so this hour we offer our praise and our prayers, but mostly, O oh God, we offer ourselves 
For we are in need of forgiveness. We are in need of freedom from locked down ways of thinking and being. Breathe in us fresh winds of your spirit, we pray. Set us free as only you can. For we are people who have received your marvelous gifts, people who seek to live for your glory through Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. I invite you to listen for God's word to you. Grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Christ our Lord. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, well, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of the Lord. In many ways, I learned a lot about sharing ideas when I was young and playing outside with my friends. In fact, my friends and I would play in our backyards and in the woods that ran behind our houses on the street where we all lived. We loved to move into a world of imagination, into mysteries often, and, and, and so that we could invent the, the story the way we wanted to tell it. It was an ever-evolving reality into which we would move, sometimes even intriguing ourselves with our clever twists and turns of the next thing that somebody would just add to the story, all while we played. Large leaves from a tree we could become money, and, and a patio which separated our backyard from the woods that ran behind all of our houses, uh, that was equipped with a fireplace and a grill and a picnic table near a, near a swing set. But that whole area, in our minds, could become a hotel with a restaurant and rooms. Our stories were really quite compelling. 
Sometimes we would leave the tame world of this manicured backyard and we would actually wander into that mysterious woods behind with those tall deciduous trees, lots of underbrush, a few paths we had carved out for what we called secret passages. It was a fairly safe place since there were really no wild animals in our woods, no snakes other than the green ones, or at least, at least that's what we hoped. No danger was greater than just what we imagined. Well, the world we invented was far less interesting to me than anything on television. Television had made its way into most of our living rooms in the 1950s and early 60s. Our world was three-dimensional, not flat like that screen. It seemed so much less predictable than those stories on TV, which meant for us it was both intriguing and it was full of opportunity. As you might imagine, we made up the rules as we went along so we could always stay on, well, you, I guess you'd say, this side of the law. We knew who were the bad guys and who were the good guys, and of course we were the good guys, and once you know you're good and then you set those parameters around it, it's easy to recognize, well, who isn't? Who might be the enemy, and the threat in this uncertain world we were moving through? In fact, in our world, all things were possible on a summer afternoon. Sometimes we even would play after school in the fall or the spring unless it was too wet or, or too cold to play outside. It was always wonderful to add to each other's thoughts as together we built a most fascinating story. I guess all those games explain why I never had trouble believing what I couldn't see. Reality is both what is right before us but it's also what we imagine as well. It's important to remember that imagination is not limited to just things made up. Sometimes we imagine things that are real. Sometimes imagination bypasses those sensors that we have in our minds, and, and, and it can tap into a deeper kind of knowing, into in, intuition, you might call it, into, into things not yet materialized, but real nonetheless. As I've often quoted writer Elaine Pagels, what we imagine is of enormous consequence because we all do it, because what we imagine begins to shape us. It helps shape our worldview just as much as facts and figures shape it. It becomes part of the lens through which we see and, and perceive things and the way we really see each other and, and interact with each other. The expanded ground on which we stand it helps, it helps give us perspective. The place, it becomes the place from which we engage all these other realities that we might know through our five senses. I, of course, gave up making up games when I grew older. Unfortunately, they were sometimes replaced by much more serious games with higher stakes. But recently, recently I've had the delightful privilege of experiencing things again, this time with my grandson Michael as we run from dragons in his backyard. Dragons he's convinced are after us. He sees and he hears them and he warns me because I don't have his keen senses. We run together for cover in the direction that only he knows, the direction away from danger. Our weapons of defense might look a lot like sticks to you falling from trees nearby, but they are swords to Michael, swords by which to fight the enemy should our hiding place be found. Michael knows a good sword when he sees it, and I find myself thinking the sticks just all look alike, which makes me wonder, what happened to my imagination? I wonder if sometimes I've grown too tired of fighting dragons of a different sort in the face of ever rolling realities that pass before us all these days. Maybe colliding worldviews make it harder. Even when our thoughts are different these days from long ago in my backyard, it seems that back then we cared about keeping each other as part of the story. We needed everybody to still play. We didn't just need our own version of things to be the, the best one or the last one. No one wanted to write the story by themselves. It wouldn't be as good. We knew it. 
we knew we needed each other. Those were the good old days, you might say. Kids are sometimes smarter than adults. Well, the Christian faith had hardly gotten off the ground when worldviews began to collide. We heard about them in Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. Of course, they had entered a reality that insisted on more than could meet the eye since it was a new divine reality. The dilemma was who was to be the leader that they should follow in the treacherous world of being a Christian. After all, it was considered illegal. It was considered by some a cult for centuries. It was punishable by death in many places, in many eras. Was the leader Paul? or Cephas, or Apollos, or how about Christ? Well, it's harder to follow Christ because you can't see and hear and touch him like you can Paul and Cephas and Apollos. And besides, their worldviews could be heard with the hearing of the ear. And when we think of Christ, we run into that cross. And, and well, the cross still had not so much appeal. Well, the conflicts were many. And some were very divisive, almost DNA changing for those who had understood Christianity in just one way as the fulfillment of Judaism's promised Messiah finally arriving. The dilemma was what to do with these other people that were interested, with the Gentiles, the uncircumcised, the unclean. Some said they needed to become Jews so they could become Christians. Others said, I don't know. It depended on who you asked what their world view was. It was a big deal. These were very different worldviews, vying to be the real ones for this uncertain and threatening world and a new faith expression in it. Well, the Apostle Paul set out to address this in a letter to a rather sophisticated church in Corinth. What Paul wrote in words, which you've already heard in those 22 verses, Peter, another apostle, experienced in a waking dream that's recorded in Acts of the Apostles. You probably remember the story. Peter, Peter went up on the rooftop to pray and he became hungry. He wanted something to eat and while it was being prepared, it said in the, in the book of Acts, he fell into a trance. He, he saw the heaven open up and something like a, a large sheet coming down and, and being lowered to the ground by, by its four corners. And in it, this is what was important, in it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and bed, birds of the air. And he heard a voice, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything like that. It's profane. It's unclean. And the voice said to him a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing that descended then was taken back up to heaven. Well, understandably, Peter wanted to stick to the rules. He wanted to stick to the worldview he knew and loved and here, though, were the words confronting him. What God has made and called clean, even though it doesn't look like it, don't you call unclean. You know, it's things like that that really mess us up. We want certainty. We want predictability. Just like Peter, he wanted to do it right. We want our version of normal. We want the rules to stay the same so we can follow them. But what happens, like it did to him, what happens if God is doing a new thing? Can we let God's purposes or God's ways change? Could we be missing cues, we might ask? After all, it's hard to know the difference between failure to be faithful and being too rigid and fixed on things. Sometimes in trying to be faithful, we get stuck. So much so that we can't see a new day that's dawning. Well, that's what happened to members of the faith community of the early church. They certainly then had conflicts. They had betrayals. It was a scramble to learn a credo, a creed by which to live. Something they could hang their hat on when things seemed to be changing. 
It seems that what needed to happen was for grace to enter the conversation. The leaders, the followers, began to listen to each other, and that is the story of Acts of the Apostles. They, they had to listen to the voice that, that seemed to come from God. They had to debate what to do, what was now acceptable. Could these unclean people be Christian, or did they have to first become Jews? They had to quit assuming that God was on their side, which was always problematic, because they get pretty mixed up for a long time, and it still does with, with good people differing, with different worldviews, all convinced God is on their side. I mean, who doesn't want God on their side, right? Well, all I can say is that in my neighborhood all those many years ago, our stories were much more fluid than some of these I read about, more open to opinion than the ones that I often deal with now. Maybe we liked being together so much that it was more important to us than having the last word on what was going to happen next in this story. Well, many of us have never lived in a time when we've seen so many really well-articulated worldviews, heartfelt worldviews colliding. So many people who are very certain, with no real interest in having relationships with those whose ideas were radically different than theirs. It's hard because we all really want to be right and we really want God on our side or we want to be on God's side. We want to believe the right things. We want to do the right things. Paul said the Jews want a sign. The Greeks want wisdom. But I preach Christ crucified. Foolishness to everybody except to those who are being saved. Paul encountered what we encounter. We want signs, we want wonders, we want perfectly logical constructs. But what God offers is something really different. It's sacrificial love. Something that seems foolish to practical people, weak to those who have the worldview of strength that has no vulnerability. The gospel really is sometimes countercultural. Well, Peter came down off the rooftop, and after his experience there, he was guided to a Gentile whom God had already spoken to, a Gentile who a few days before would have seemed terribly unclean to Peter. In fact, he admitted it to him. But now, not so much. He trusted the vision. He trusted the voice that was about a new thing. And Paul, Paul kept writing to churches, but you know the truth is it would be still to this church at Corinth that he would write one of the most beautiful descriptions, not of wisdom, not of great strength, but of the sacrificial love that seems sometimes so foolish. You know the words, love is patient, he wrote. It's kind, it's not envious or boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. This love does not insist on its own way. Can you imagine? It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. This love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. This love never ends. That's God's saving love in Jesus Christ, as it was then and as it is now. That hasn't changed. You know, it's a better story than anything I could have made up back then or could make up now. It's the kind of story I want to be part of always and forever. It's the kind of story that will live on even after all our thoughts have been exhausted and many proven to be short-sighted, even if well intended. It's a worldview that cannot be invented, only given and received. It seems as fresh as the new day's morning air, and yet as old as time itself, because you see it is eternal. Just imagine, just imagine a world like that. And then, you know what? 
the invitation is, as it's always been, then help write the story. All thanks be to God. to uh, make an announcement today about a project that the youth do every year, uh, and it's in a process, of, it's begun now, it's, it's called the Super Bowl of Caring, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, I want you to see a video, if you want to see a little bit more about it, you can, it's uh, posted on our St. Mark YouTube channel, so you can see uh, get more detailed information, but mostly what you need to know is it's a great competition. It's a competition between uh, the, the churches and Mission Presbytery youth groups are, are raising money 
or raising food items, either one, you can either donate money or food, it goes to the Hill Country uh, Family Services, and it needs to be, uh, hap it needs, all needs to happen before February 7th, and so I encourage you uh, to consider the food items that you might want to donate or to give money, and uh, not just for a good cause, but because our youth group probably wants to win the competition, and so it's, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful thing to do, and I encourage you to be part of it. But do check the, the YouTube uh, channel and see the, see the video and see more about it. We come now in our service to a time of prayer, and so I invite you into the prayer as we join our voices, our hearts, and our minds and my vo with my voice in making this prayer. Gracious God, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I will abide in you. So what we ask is that you grant us grace to abide. We know that abiding somehow means trusting. It means resting in you as a sure place in a sometimes uncertain world. We know that abiding means letting your word dwell in us and your Holy Spirit fill us. It means stirring up the courage to live as those who have much more to gain than to lose as disciples of Christ. Because following you is often just the loss of empty promises. The setting aside of false gods and futile plans. Following you often is about gaining. Gaining life abundant. It is about having the kind of relationships that, that let us bring to you our thoughts and our feelings. Those that find their ways to words, but those that have no words. We know your spirit reads our hearts. And so, oh God, we do come to you with whatever words we can find and with whatever longings that we know you understand as we pray. And we do pray for ourselves and we do pray for others. We ask that what is broken or diseased in body, mind, and soul be healed. We can think of people who are dealing with all these issues, and so we bring those by name to you now in the silence of our hearts. We think, O oh God, of the deep abyss of grief, and we pray that it might be filled with your presence. We bring those people to you who have had great losses. We know, O oh God, in your hands all of our relationships can be better, and so we bring to you our families, our friends, that we might be more honest in our relationships, might share more of who we are, might support one another, might bear one of other's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ, as the scripture says. Hear our prayers. We know, O oh God, as the Apostle Paul wrote, the folly of the cross is freedom. And so we bring to you ourselves to know that freedom, to know what it means to give ourselves to sacrificial love and to know that your truth and your wisdom is more than anything we can figure out. We ask, O oh God, for the gift of gratitude for all that blesses us. We give thanks for the people in our lives who help us become more than we have been and who forgive us for being less than what we could be. We give you thanks for the opportunity to put our energy into work, into vocation. We pray that what we do might accomplish your ends and bring you glory. Oh God, we also pray this day for wisdom to guide those who lead, those who want to be leaders. We pray for justice to look a whole lot more like mercy for prosperity to spill over into generosity, for love to become the standard of everything we do, your love. Oh God, we make these our prayers through Christ our Lord, who taught us all to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. Following the benediction, there will be more music as we conclude our service, but we receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ meet you where you are. May the love of God fill your heart. And may the wisdom and power of the Holy Spirit guide you and protect you this day and always. Amen. For the unclean, the unholy, for the broken, the unworthy who came. Jesus, you came for the wounded, for the hurting, for the lost and for the lost. Defeat.